Now we're going to show you some flesh and blood examples of the good and the bad, starting with the story of a lawyer who became despised in his own community because he did what he thought the legal code of ethics required. He kept everything his client confidential, even though it concerned the murders of two young girls. The principle of confidentiality is the cornerstone of the lawyer-client relationship. It's meant to protect the rights of the client. But occasionally a case comes along that raises the question, what about the rights of the public? A uh, client comes to you, you're like a confessor. You're like a clergyman. And what he tells you, that's it. Frank Armony, in many ways the image of the typical American lawyer. His home base, a medium-sized city, Syracuse, New York. His work, a small general practice law firm catering to local needs. But some years ago, he stumbled into the annals of legal history with a case that pitted his professional ethics against his community standards of decency and morality. July 1973, Lake Pleasant in the Adirondack Mountains of New York, about a two-hour drive from Syracuse. Nearby, along this lonely wooded road, 18-year-old Philip Dombluski is stabbed to death. After the biggest manhunt in New York State history, State troopers shoot and capture 36-year-old former convict Robert Garrow. He's from Syracuse, and he's one of Frank Armony's clients. At Garrow's request, a court appoints Armony, seen here in 1973, and lawyer Francis Belgie to defend him. From his hospital bed, Garrow confides to his lawyers that he's also killed two young girls. 20-year-old Susan Petz from Chicago and 16-year-old Alicia Houck from Syracuse, both reported missing by their frantic parents. Following Garrow's directions, the lawyers find the body of Susan Petz in a mine shaft. Alicia Houck's in the undergrowth bordering Oakwood Cemetery in Syracuse. The police already suspect Garrow of killing the girls, and now the lawyers have proof, but they tell no one, not the authorities, not even the desperate parents of the missing girls. This was something that was really momentous for us because of the conflict within us. Your mind screaming one way, relieve these parents, you know, what, what is your responsibility? Uh, should you report this? Shouldn't you report it? Uh, your, 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 your moral, uh, you know, one sense of morality wants you to relieve the grief. And the other? And the other is your sworn duty. After the lawyers made their grisly discovery here in this cemetery, they were committed to what was to become a precedent-setting ethical conflict. There was the duty to keep their clients secrets versus the citizen's obligation to report crimes. And there was the moral duty to end the uncertainty and to ease the suffering of the grieving parents. It was a conflict that the lawyers were never able to escape. And all we went by, actually, at the time, and uh, it was our oath of office to keep inviolate the secrets of our clients. But it was hard to keep that oath when faced with the distraught parents desperate for information about their daughters. After Susan Pett's father showed up at the office, Armony was so shaken by the meeting that Alicia Houck's father never got past the receptionist. I was invited to his office. And when I got there, his girl said he wasn't in. And I called several different times for an appointment and I was refused. I don't think I would have been able to stand the pressure of that meeting. I just couldn't trust myself to meet him face to face. Didn't you think that there was a factor of just common decency here? I don't know if I can explain it, but to me, it's a question of which is the higher moral good. Between at that what? The question of the Constitution, the question of even a bastard like him having a proper defense, having pr adequate representation, being able to trust his lawyer as to what he says. Against what? as against the fact that I have a dead girl, the fact that her body's there, as against the breaking hearts of a parent. But they are, it's a terrible thing to play God at that moment, but in my judgment, and I still feel that way, that their suffering is not worth jeopardizing my sworn duty or my oath of office or the Constitution. Armony considered tipping off the parents or the authorities anonymously, but in the end he decided that even that would breach Robert Garrow's confidence. 
What is the point about applying these principles to a piece of scum like Garrel? Well, because if it doesn't belong to uh, a piece of scum uh, to, uh, to, to the worst of us, then it can't be belong to the best of it. Where do you make the exception? Judge William Ennerman, the former Lake Pleasant DA who prosecuted Robert Garrell, thinks Armony was right not to tell anyone, even indirectly, about the Hauk and Pets murders. The discovery of a dead person, the resulting investigation of the scene of the body, the post-mortem examination, can lead to a lot of evidence, potentially incriminating your client. The Actually, the best thing for the lawyer to do, if he's given that information, is to keep it confidential. But Ennerman scornfully rejected Armini's attempt to plea bargain with that information. Armini hoped to swap Garrow's confession to the Hauk and Pets murders for an insanity plea in the Dombluski killing, convinced that Garrow would spend the rest of his life on a psychiatric ward. I thought it was reprehensible. Why did you think that was reprehensible? Because they were trying to make a deal whereby this guy would get back on the street at some point within the not too distant future. I don't think that's in the best interest of society nor in a proper defense. But a lawyer has an ethical duty to be as zealous as he can in the defense of his client. Within certain limitations, the lawyer is also an officer of the court and as such he's responsible to the public and to the court in June 1974, Garrow was returned to Lake Pleasant to stand trial for the Dombluski murder. Hostility toward Garrow and his lawyers ran deep. When the lawyers took up residence in a local inn, even the proprietors, John and Jenny Zeiser, became targets of ostracism. Uh, people in the community seemed to take sides. In what way? I don't know. They were just kind of like mean. Some wouldn't even speak to you if you'd go to the post office. Several of them stayed away. They didn't come to see us. One individual actually accosted me on the courthouse lawn and uh, said, why are you harboring these people? Meanwhile, the lawyers were confronted by threats of violence. Like the morning, Armini found a death threat scrawled on his breakfast napkin. And it says here that we can take you out any time. That kid killer better not get off. That's uh, fairly unambiguous, isn't it? Yeah. When the case came up for trial here at the courthouse in Lake Pleasant, emotions were running so high against Bob Garrow in this community that they had to call in every available adult citizen of the county before they could get a jury. What the jury heard was a string of shocking confessions designed to convince the court that Garrow was insane. He admitted to seven rapes and four murders, including those of Alicia Houck and Susan Petz. Then more shocks as Armini and Belgi admitted that they'd known about the murders had even tried to plea bargain with the information. The public was stunned and uncomprehending. The Armony home was plagued with phone threats and hate mail. A Molotov cocktail was discovered out back. Armony's clients and even some close friends were repelled, like the one who stopped Armony on the street one day. Well, he had been a good friend for many years, and he said to me that, you know, if I was a father, I'd shoot you. And he would. The man who was the father, Bill Houck, and his wife, Marilyn, filed a complaint against the lawyers with the New York State Bar. We well, were all outraged at the fact that, you know, there were probably people that knew more than was ever uh, told. And it just seems that the judicial system was uh, more in favor of the guilty than uh, the people that it governs. Um, I, I don't think that, you know, I, I, I just think that the lawyer had a, a moral obligation here. When the Guerra trial was over, the case took a bizarre turn. His lawyers were themselves hauled before a grand jury in this courthouse in Syracuse, investigating whether their silence in representing their client itself amounted to a crime. But when the prosecutors got down to it, the only violation of law they could come up with was an obscure public health code that required the reporting of a dead body for burial. The grand jury cleared Armini, but indicted Belgi. Three courts in succession dismissed the indictment, citing the primacy of the lawyer-client relationship in such matters. The state bar also dismissed the House complaint against the two lawyers. When you're getting their lawyers against lawyers, it's 
kind of a closed fraternity. The way I look at it. And nothing's been changed since. Mm -hmm. There's been nothing new and any laws changed. I can't understand what, how they got away with doing what, what they did. It's a this for everybody. For you and for me and for the public, because it could happen to someone else tomorrow. And the same thing would happen over again. Cindy once wrote to Armini, asking him to explain his actions. I start to write an answer to her, and I never could answer it. Why not? How do you explain? <laughs> I caused them pain. I prolonged their pain. There's, there's no... How can you, how can you, what do you say to someone like that? There's nothing I can say to justify that in their minds. You couldn't justify it to me. Frank Armini's health, marriage, and law practice suffered disastrously from the Garrow affair. He and his wife Mary have spent the years since then putting their lives back together and wondering whether the unsought battle he fought was worth it. Well, economically it wasn't worth the price, but... But then he didn't do it for economic reasons, or he wouldn't have done it in the first place because it was an assigned case. Uh, and I think, knowing my husband, that if the same opportunity came and he was asked to defend someone in a similar uh, circumstance, he would probably do it again, even with his health being what it is. That's what I think. Would you? I don't know.